Okay, let us go ahead and get ourselves started with part two of session 17. For session 17, we want to look at the whole issue of evaluating multiple building shapes and using Alpha to do that. But along the way, let's even talk about how we start to create these forms that you can evolve and kind of change and flex as these different building shapes and where they come from. In general, the script for what we're doing is going to look something like this. The idea behind Optimo is that you create a generation of different values to test. So rather than kind of testing them individually, you know, in this example, what I do is actually go through and basically display all the different values of the generation kind of on the same screen. Just, um, it doesn't have to be done that way. This just sort of makes it uh, a little clearer about what's happening in the entire generation so you can sort of see the generations converging. But we'll take a look at that. What happens is, based on those generation of values, we can go through and evaluate it. We can go through and evaluate some sort of fitness function. The fitness function should start out to be very, very simple, just reporting back something like the gross volume. But we could also then start to say, oh, how about the surface area to the volume? What's going to happen with all these fitness functions is, typically, what Optimo tries to do, if you're using Optimo as a scheme, It'll try to minimize things, because that's what it likes to do. Generally, optimization involves minimization. If you want to maximize things, often what you have to do is one over something, or say, you know, some number minus a value, so that you can sort of drive more of a positive, or basically you're, you're, you're trying to basically, you know, find a way to make a, a large number turn into a small number. Okay, so we'll find out something like that. But we can evaluate one input. We can do a one input with sort of a formula as opposed to uh, just kind of thinking about it as a single value. We can start taking two inputs, okay, and then ultimately export the images. There's a lot of things we can do with these things. But let's start simple and just look at this whole issue of displaying this generation of elements and where these elements came from. So if you can, let's go ahead and we'll start with opening up 17.2. Let's find the specific file, though. I close up my little Optimo thing happening over here. I should comment, although I'm sort of demonstrating what we're doing in Optimo, you don't have to be using Optimo for the final assignment. You know, you can just use list maps or something like that. Optimo is a really good thing to know about as a way to quickly converge on things, but there's a little infrastructure involved in setting things up, so don't feel it has to be that way. I'm going to start out with just multiple buildings. Oh, I think I have uh, several things open. There we go. This is actually a very simple little thing right here. This is just really the box element. The box has a length, a height, and a width. If you want a very rectangular building, the box element may be your uh, kind of candidate. If you look at how the box element is defined, though, let's take a look at that for a second. I can edit the family. And let's just see how it works. Try looking at the floor plan view. You'll see that box is defined in a fairly simple way in that there's a profile, a profile which is drawn all the way to kind of represent that rectangular surface. <coughs> what happens here is it has a parameter up here called width assigned to it, and a parameter over here assigned called depth, which are all just really uh, just dimensions which are mo moving uh, reference lines, and then the box form is basically changing with that. Okay? These equals on either side are really all about just keeping it centered, so as you flex it, it doesn't really go too far. Okay? This is kind of a really simple way to go through and kind of create like the box. The height, you might wonder where that comes from in the elevation view. Let's see if I can find it in which elevation view. I should draw them in south. I have a reference line at the top, and that's kind of driving the height. So this thing just as these three different um, parameters are entered, goes through and resizes itself and kind of makes it, kind of reshape it to whatever we need here. So that's sort of a, a box. We'll do another one. Yeah. And again, how did you open that? It's not in edit family, is it? It wasn't edit family. Okay. Or if, yeah. Well, it's going to 
show you how you create another one. Let me go back over to, uh, where did it go? Let's kind of close out some of these. You'll see that these guys right here, they are, these are masses, okay? And if you want to use masses, which is a really good way to do it, because then masses can get divided up into uh, mass floors, and you could ultimately kind of put the panels all over the size of the masses. If you want to create a new one, we could do something like this. For example, let me go through and say that I'm going to create a new family. Actually, it's not even there. It's, uh, it's really the conceptual mass. I could either go to it or go to it here. But it's, this is the conceptual mass family. Let's just take a look at it. I think that's it. Okay. These are a series of uh, different uh, reference planes, of planes going uh, front to back and side to side. And on this plane, we can go through and define a profile. In general, as we're defining these masses that are going to be your building forms, we start by defining profiles. We can do this a couple of different ways. I could go through and do the boxes. Let's go ahead and, yeah. Well, let me kind of show it to you this way. Generally, okay, if you're going to go through and create kind of squarish shapes, the way to do it is as follows. Under create, I can basically draw myself. Oh, I'm placing lines right now. I don't want to be doing that right now. Yeah. Escape. <coughs> I want to get to a reference plane. There it is. What I typically do is draw some planes, which will represent the outer surfaces. And then based on that, I'll put some dimensions on there, which are going to control the uh, actual sizes. So if I go through and put align dimensions, I can say, let's go from here to here. If I want to center this thing, I'll put an equal dimension on here. I'll sort of say, great, there's going to be an equality constraint that keeps our building centered on the insertion point. And then I can put a distance here. And the way I make that distance a parameter is I choose the dimension and I add a label to it. So I can say, let's make it a parameter. And this is going to be oh, the link. It's going to be an instance parameter so I can change it every time and every different instance of the building. So if you want squarish shapes, you put reference lines and you put dimensions on them. And then what happens is as you go through and design your building, the key is what you got to do is basically align and lock the different reference lines to those. And then as that parameter changes, that shape will change. So that's the basis of the, the twisting box, the twisting tower, all those sort of things. They all sort of come up with this. And if we open the twisting tower, the twisting box, we'll do that in just a second. We'll sort of see how one of those works. To align and lock on the reference, did yes. you control click or did you just click click and then I just I go for the align tool and then go once over here and then on the line. So it's it's just, it's just two clicks. Okay. <coughs> and lock it in there. Okay, so that's how you generally start, but let's do something a little bit different. You were thinking about a circular shape or something like that, so let's just kind of show you. That would come out a little bit differently. If you have circular parameters and you want to use something like that, we could go through and just say that, hey, I want to go through and use the circle tool and draw a profile down here at the bottom. Now. As I draw the circle, notice I'm going to go through and make sure that it's really hooking to the intersection there. Okay, and then draw that on out. 
you'll notice I have a little dimension right here. If I click away, the temporary dimension will go away, but I can go back and add that dimension. Just by under create, let's say, let's put a radial dimension back on it. The idea is any dimension, you know, can be made into a parameter. So if I want to go through and change that into a parameter, I'll say that this is now going to be, oh, my bottom radius. It's going to be an instance parameter again. And you can check it out just to make sure that it is doing what you think it should be doing. Go through and try putting a different radius in there. Yeah, it's looking pretty good. Now, I've been drawing down here at level one. Level one's kind of an okay place to be looking at. If I want to go through and have an upper radius two and connect the two, I need to kind of put a level in there and draw the profile on that level. Okay. Oh, I can do that in a number of different ways. Let me do it from the south elevation. What I'm going to do is just draw a reference plane in here. Then I'll say, let's put a dimension on that, just from the level up to there. This will be the height. And I can add a dimension to this and call it tower height, add a parameter to it. Now, super. If you have a radius and a height, and you just sort of make a form out of that, it'll make a perfect cylinder. If you want to think about making it more of a cone or something that's deformable at the top, you put a second profile at the top and then loft them together. Or you could have uneven profiles if you want to have a square to a circle or an octagon to a circle. You know, you could have all these different sort of things going on. So let's go ahead and draw that other one. For this other one, I'm just going to draw it in the 3D view, looking down from the top. See if I can make this work. I'm going to say, let's also draw a circle here. I'm going to put it not at level one. Well, actually, if I want to make it a placement plane, this is kind of interesting. What I have to do is actually, I think, give it a name. So either I need to add it as a level or over here, I can give this thing a name. OK, this is tower top. I think that'll make it available to me. There we go. So now I can draw that same thing over here. Give that a radius. And again, give that a parameter. Again, an instance parameter. OK, so if you have a couple different profiles to work with, and I guess where this question got started is, like, how do you even create these forms? And it all starts with just creating two different profiles that you can lock together. Okay. If you have those two different forms, I can grab that form. I'm going to control click and grab that form. And say, let's create a form out of those things. Be interesting. I'm surprised it has the taper in there. Yeah. As opposed to just being straight. I'll think about why that is. It probably has something the way I did in 3D. Think about that, because something's a little odd. Oh, it's actually not centered. I'm sort of off-center. That I sort of get. Hmm. When I drew my radiuses, I didn't actually put them. I put them around that intersection as opposed to the intersection down here in the center. That's kind of OK in there. It's interesting. And for the Freedom Tower, do you have like three 
planes. Yes. Three profiles and lofted all three of them together. So let's take a look at that, just so you sort of get the sense of that. So for example, if I go to, oh, let's see, it's probably in here. Here's the twisting triangular mass. See if that works. So this actually has three profiles, one, two, and three, and they're all lofted together. See if I can look at it from the top. I'm trying to figure out where you could actually see them. In these cases, though, each of these different profiles, and let me warn you about this with radiuses, each of those profiles is actually a part that I brought in from somewhere. It turns out rotating things is actually kind of difficult in the scheme of things. So it's actually better to go through and draw the profile as a separate part than bring that in and lock the profiles together. So this is actually made in kind of a two-step operation where the profile is defined here where I have some radiuses, I have something which is indicating just the, uh, the amount of rotation that's all going through, and I'm drawing these different arcs sort of based on the radius and I don't know, a little more complexity to doing this one. I guess what I'd say is as you start thinking about your shape, if it's going to be an unusual shape, you know, come in tomorrow or like and let's talk about it on Thursday in terms of really how to best define that specific shape and kind of give you something that you can flex. It's not really just starts with having something to flex. But go ahead and take a look at that one. Freedom Tower is somewhat similar. It's actually made out of a couple because there's the lower part of the building which stays square. So the bottom of the ring and then where you know the second ring is, that's squarish. So there's a profile here, and there's a profile there. Then there's this upper profile here. Let's see if I can select that. This one's a little bit different. Let's see what we got going on over there. Tower base, octagonal taper. Let me edit that family. So here I have this little octagonal thing. where sort of based on these reference lines, I'm creating octagonal shape, just uh, based on the flat side, the flat side here, splitting them evenly, and then drawing the lines between. So if you have an unusual shape, kind of like I'm seeing, we'll talk about how you do that. There's a lot of flexibility in terms of doing different shapes because not only can you sort of uh, do straight lines, See, we could also draw, you can draw circles, <coughs> that's kind of cool. You can draw all these different sort of polygons very easily. So if you want a six-sided or an eight-sided or a 12-sided or something like that, and you have a regular form, feel free to go through and use those. But it all starts with just sort of messing around with those things. But once you have those things, let's go back to how you actually apply it and what you do with it. And that is back over in the high-level example. So I'm going to close up a bunch of these things because we can spend some more time. Again, for what you're doing, go for an interesting shape, but not incredibly interesting, because you don't want to spend all your time just trying to like figure out why your form won't flex. So if need be, start out with rectangles and boxes and stuff like that, because you know you can control those. <coughs> and we'll get a little grander from there. OK. So I basically got these little box shapes in here, and I can do these with these uh, towers just the same. But let's go ahead and start with them. Well, actually, no, I'll just go through it. Let's go back over here, and we'll come over and say, um, what is it? Let's open instead of this one. The other one is uh, multiple buildings, twisting tower. Let's open that one. OK. 
Now, that may look like a funny version of the twisting tower for you because it got very, very fat in the middle. Okay, but it is nonetheless that tower. Let's go ahead and choose it. I'll say, oh, for example, the mid radius, I'll make it 100 instead of uh, 300. You'll sort of see it looks a little bit better. Okay. So this, I would say, is a population of five of the buildings. Okay. Each of those buildings can start out with a different set of input values. And we can change a lot of different things. We can go through and change the twist as a rotation or, or as an input. We can change the heights. We can change the mid radius, the bottom radius. We can choose anything we want to flex about it and choose what we want to report out of it. Whether we want to get the volume of it, whether we want to get the um, surface area to the volume, any of those different things are all sort of possibilities. So let's go back over and open up Dynamo and kind of see what we have in mind. The idea to start with was really, could we go through and just go through and look at, for example, the gross volume as a fitness function. So let's come back over to Dynamo. And we'll start, oh, let's go to 17.2. And let's start with 1B. 1B is just really the whole idea of generate, displaying a generation of elements. So we'll start there, because that's actually fairly straightforward. So for now, I am going to go through and I'm just import the gross volume and gross surface area. OK. Just you really use this mostly the way it was set up. All this stuff over here on this side in terms of like going through and doing the optimization and stuff like that, just ignore that for right now because we're not going to use that for just a little bit. Over on the left side over here, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go through and well, just choose some different objects. Looks like I was first starting with a box. We can do it with a tower though instead. Let's try that. What's going to happen is we are going to basically say what element it is we're going to go through and flex. In my case, oh, right now it's currently set up as box. Is box still in there? Let's see if it is. Box is just always easy. Yeah, box is in there too, so we could use that too. Go through and take out these twisting towers. We're going to create a generation of boxes to start with. So it looks something like this. What I'm going to do is we're going to go through and generate some different values for the height of the box. It could be any of those different things, anywhere from 10 to 9 feet, for example. And it's sort of flexing it to see if it works. I'm going to get, it looks like there's seven of them here. Okay. This population is going to have a bunch of x values or height values from 10 to 90. As we go zipping on down here, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to create some different family instances of the box. But what I want to do is go through and just go through and give them some points. So I'm going to give them some y points. I'm going to put them all in a row at 0. For the x points, what I want to do is basically just go 0 to the population size minus 1 times 20. That's going to put them every 20 feet apart from each other, incrementing by 20. Okay. So if you run that and we list flatten that, we should get a whole bunch of those. Let's start with that. Just give that a run. <coughs> see what happens. OK. What has happened is, if we zoom back over here, OK? You'll see there are uh, seven boxes hanging around there. That's OK. Looks like my uh, spacing of 20 is a little bit too close for the size of my boxes right now. So if I want to spread them out a little bit, not to worry. I'll just give them a wider spacing. I'll say they're going to be 50 feet apart. 
Let's run that again. Okay. What this is trying to do is this is going through and it's trying to figure out what the volume of the box is and it's ultimately trying to converge on what the lowest volume of the box is. Okay? And you know how that should sort of work. If I have input values anywhere from 10 to 90, you'll see what do I have over here. This one has a height of 18. This one has a, a value of 49. This one over here has a value of 56. If I want to try to go through and minimize the volume, what I'm going to do is just run through a number of iterations and see if I can go back and find that minimum volume. And yeah, when it goes through and does it, hopefully they're going to end up being closer to this guy down here in terms of what's going on. So the interesting thing to see would be if you actually ran it for more generations, I'm just basically reporting out, I think what I'm reporting out is the volume. Actually, I should be careful. I think it says fitness functions reporting gross volume. Let's just check a look and see how this works and see if that's actually what it is doing. I'm going to edit this node. So that great. For this population of boxes that are coming in, super. There's uh, going to be seven boxes coming in. That's fine. There's seven. That's all kind of going OK over here. I'm going to go through and try and report some report parameters. Well, let's see what's going on here. I got the population zero. That is interesting there. The list of elements, <coughs> population list. That should be the first one. That's a little strange. I'm not finding what I want to be finding here. The idea is what we're trying to do is basically go through and for every item in the population, just go through and take them one at a time and actually pass it on through and then say evaluate the gross volume of each of those different parameters or each of those different elements in the population. So let's take a look down here. When we go down to this custom node, what it's going to do is basically go through and set the parameter by name. Okay. You're basically supposed to get the index, you're getting a list of elements, you're going to get the ID index that we're evaluating. Okay. Say so basically set that element by the test parameter transaction in and get the parameter values back out of it. Okay, so that part's actually looking like what it's supposed to look like, but let's see what's not working here. I got some nulls kind of hanging around in here. This is just going to report out the volume. That should be okay. Let's see if we can figure this out. It almost always has something to do with lists. So let's just kind of see if we can figure out What's going on with the list? This guy over here, okay, the list of elements that are coming in, it looks like seven different boxes. That part's looking pretty good. Okay. This part over here should be a list of different values. What is it? Hang on, when you want that? Test parameter two, that's the list of test values that are supposed to be coming in. Okay. It's reporting null right now, and that's the part that sort of worries me a little bit. So what I want to do is I want to watch this and see what's going on, because if pop zero is uh, null, that sort of indicates that something else is going on here. So a little bit of debugging together. Let's just kind of take a look at what that list actually comes in looking like. It's even null in What's that? It comes in as null. It kind of, well, that's not very good. If it's null right there, let's go back and sort of figure out what's going on up here. But nothing's being fed into population list, right? Okay. That should be coming then as... If that's the function. Okay, so it's all screen. So the function of y should be doing that. This function apply should be taking up ahead and basically applying that and it should be coming in that way. So let's just kind of see if we can figure this out. Because no, you're right, it should be coming in that way. If it's not coming in, we got some interesting problem. 
Okay, we definitely have the boxes, so our population list is the part that we're having troubles with. So let's come back over here and sort of see what's happening up here. That should be our list right there. It's all this 16, 24, all that kind of stuff. It should be applied down there. It should be coming through the list of the fitness functions and being plugged in as that population list. But you say it's not, so that has to be worried. Do we have to flatten the thing coming out of NSGA underscore two? Because it's got another list with all zeros after it. Say that again. In, in one B, the original file. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, does it matter that that second list has a bunch of zeros? Yeah, actually, what those are going to be is that's going to be the place where it's going to hold the values. Oh, the, the new one's coming in. Okay. Yeah, so these are all the height values. Those are all those coming through. Let's see if we can figure it out. And if not, we just have to panic a little bit. Okay, because it's supposed to come on down, and it's supposed to come on down here, and feed that back out. Even in here, let me do a watch over here for a second. Because sometimes with this fitness functions and all this kind of stuff, I'm a little bit worried about whether it's actually returning the right value. Let's come back over here. Let's do some more watching. We're going to run this again. It seems to iterate. You know it's doing something. At least I know it's doing, you know. It, it is flexing the heights over here. So even the watches I have there, my, my sense is that the set is doing what it's supposed to be doing. Okay. The question is whether really uh, the get is doing what it's supposed to be doing. That should be coming out there. That says it's a function because it's depending upon that function. The function applying should be happening there. So let's just try this again. And if not, I'm going to go back and debug this example for you. It says population is zero. No. And it's getting all those values of zero, at least in terms of the last one here. The question, though, is it everyone? Let me try something else back over here. Because if I come over here and I say 17 optimal one text, let's see what's actually kind of coming out on that side over on this side, uh, back in. Uh, so it's not reporting the error, so I think that it should actually be giving us something. Example 17, optimal one text. Let me go back over here and sort of see. Let's write this out. Oops. I have to go through and make that test. Text file. There's something in there. Let's see what's in there. No, nope. okay, it's just failing on there. It's something with the null right there. Okay. I've got a little debugging to do, so I'm going to go through and, well, I might have to do that offline just to kind of figure out what's going on in here. Because that isn't necessarily you know, how you want to spend your time watching me sort of debug that. I'll go through and watch out what's going on here. Let's talk about one of the concepts that's coming out here as I go through and try to figure out <coughs> the populations aren't beating in, because they should be beating in, stuff like that. Let's talk about something else, which is as you go through and you flex this uh, tower that's going to happen in the background, that whole issue about the floors and how all the floors have a different sort of surface area and how you might want to go through and get the surface areas from all the different floors after you go through and change something. So 
Let's go through and uh, show you that, because that would be helpful for the whole economic side of what we're going to ask you to do. So how about this? We're going to try something a little bit different. I'm going to go through and, oh, we'll get rid of those for right now. And we'll put that twisting triangular mass back in. So the deal is, I've got a fabulous twisting triangular mass in here or some tower that you're going to build on that site. You would like to go through and break that up into different floor levels. So, if for example, I went through and broke it into four levels, I could say let's go to the south elevation. I look like I don't have very many levels to work with here, so I'm going to array those up again. I'm basically going to put in, oh, like 50 of them or something like that. I'll just make them, I think it's like 10 feet or something like that. And I'm going to go say, oh, make, uh, I'll make uh, 50 of them. Not too bad, as a guess goes. Okay, so what I'm going to do is take this guy over here, and let's go through and put some mass floors in here. Now the idea is, you have an overall tower, it has a volume and a surface area and things like that. You have all these different floors though. And in the economic equation, we said, hey, what if the cost of the floors was a little bit different depending upon where the height of all were? So what we're going to do is just think about how to pull those out. The idea is you actually have a lot of mass floors here. And if we wanted to go through and select a mass floor somewhere down here, okay, you see that that area is somewhere around 128,000, or what was it, no, 12,820, excuse me. When you're up here, it's a smaller floor, but it's more expensive for that floor, and it gets higher still as you go up further. So the idea is we'd like to actually know what all those different floor areas and be able to multiply them by some sort of cost. So it's actually not too bad to do that. If you want to go through and get all the floor areas, generally what we've been doing is we've been element, setting a parameter by name, regenerating it, then pulling out a gross volume or something like that. Let's go through and take that just one step further. What I can do is let's go back into Dynamo. Let's go through and we'll just set this up as a new script. Okay, so select model element. Actually, there's great mass levels right there if you want to do it internally. So I got that thing. Super. I'm going to have some different values for the top height. So what's this? The top height is 500. Great. Okay, so I'm going to have something like this. I'm going to go from, oh, 100 to 500, going by values of 10, something like that. I'm going to create a new custom node here where it's going to go through and do some list mapping and basically pull those. So if I want to, I can say even here. New custom node. OK. Oh, tower, 
storage floor data. In this, we'll have an input, which is going to be the model element. We'll have the height value or the input value. Popular transaction start and transaction end. Go ahead and bracket it because we do need to do it through and say that element set parameter by name. Okay, this part is. Definitely true. We need to come on through and go through here, take the element through, pull it out the back end. That's going to be the value to test it with, and the parameter name is going to be called just tower height if we didn't feed it in there in a little bit better. Was it top height? I guess it is. So, what we've been used to is we're going through and taking this and uh, just pulling out of this and saying element get parameter by name. So we could go through and get the uh, total volume. <coughs> Again, after the transaction end. Okay, but what you're interested in is actually going through and getting those mass floors. So if what you want to do is actually sort of get the mass floors of this element, let's see if we can find those. Get the mass of a mass floor the other way. Get the element mass. Create by mass, create by mass levels, mass floor dot mass, the mass, creates mass floors, analysis zones from a conceptual model. That's not quite there. Oh, let me say all elements this way. basically is work with this, where I want to basically take the elements of type and then go in through there, say uh, element types. See if I get mass floors out of that. Mass level data, mass surface data. Hmm, I'm going to keep playing with this. Okay, let me go ahead. I will continue building this one out and send you an update that actually has a function which will. You see where I'm going? I'm going through and setting it, but I want to pull the mass floors out. It's going to be somehow related to this pulling out the mass floors, but it's not quite there. Because what I really want to do is after I get the element updated, is go out and get the list of the mass floors and return that to you as a list of the surface areas and then you can go through and apply your cost metric for that. Okay, so oh, I will continue to pull you around on that. So look for an email message coming in about an hour or something like that. They should hopefully have a function that you could go through and use to do that to then apply the cost and the, uh, the, the real estate function too. Okay, so a couple of updates. One is kind of my uh, messing around with why my where's my population and why it's null and then this. But in the meantime, please, if you can, go ahead and just think about your form. And what it is you're going to try to flex, and we'll try to debug that one together. Okay, 
beautiful. Let us adjourn for today, and we will continue on this adventure.